The newest college football playoff bracket, uh, projected bracket, now granted this can all change with the conference champions and everything like that, has two SEC teams playing against each other again and then two Big Ten teams playing against each other. And I don't think we'll ever get to the end of the argument, who's SEC, Big Ten, who's the better, who deserves more, if it ends up this way. This would be a travesty, Coach. I think this would be the biggest travesty of the 12-team playoff if it played out this way, Coach. I, I agree. Um I also think that, you know, we've had this discussion before that by giving the the conference champions when they're not the highest ranked teams the bye, uh, what it really affects is the path to the championship. And uh, when you don't see the teams based on the quality uh, of the total season performance, um, so, you know, the number one seed should have technically the easiest path to the championship and that doesn't really happen when you allow conference champions to get seated in the top four when they're not one of the top four teams. So uh, I'm with you 100%. I think, but I did have one ahead. comment when you were talking about, you know, Miami uh, playing in cold weather and guys blowing on their hands. I just wanted to give them one coaching point that I got when I was a baseball player and I had a really tough coach and would blow on our hands when it was cold. And you know how it feels when you hit that ball and you got cold hands. And we'd blow on our hands. And, you know, his coaching point was, don't blow on your hands. You're not allowed to blow on your hands. Stick them up your ass. That's the only way. (laughs) The same outcome, Uh, huh? You're saying it's the same outcome there either way. (laughs) It is the warmest part of your body, right? Don't they? (laughs) <laughs> Don't they say that uh-huh. is the yep, warmest sure. part of the body? The cold is a real equalizer, and we had just started chatting about it this week, really. And uh, I think you know anybody that's followed college football or got a chance to go around college football understands that the vibe across the entire Southeastern Conference is different than anywhere else. And if you've never experienced it, you obviously can turn on a television and watch any of these SEC games outside of Vandy any other year than this year. Yeah. Uh, and it is a... Romp, it's all they got. It is their religion. It is their passion. It is their sport across the board. Now, in the Big Ten, obviously, Penn State fills up 100-some thousand. Michigan fills up 100-some thousand. Ohio State fills up 100-some thousand. Oregon will be able to pack out whatever they want over there. But across the board, it's not everywhere is this insane environment. So tough to win, obviously, on the road in the Southeastern Conference. The cold, though, being an equalizer as kind of the battle there for some of these Southern teams having to come up and play in the cold, I think that is what the Big Ten would respond with in that argument. Like, yeah, maybe our environment isn't 100 some thousand, and that's because our environment doesn't even make it conducive to happen. But the cold weather, I think, is the equalizer in this entire thing for some of these Big Ten teams. And if we end up with no Southern teams going into the Big Ten, Terrence, boy, that would be... That would that be a stink. big miss. That would be a big – and then on the flip side, Big Ten schools having to go down into the south, that would be a travesty if we didn't have that. Don't you think, Coach? Legitimately, you coach in the Big Ten yeah, and I, the I, SEC. That's two different – literally two different worlds of football there. I don't think there's any question about it. But I do think that the weather does impact the game. You know, the ball is harder to throw. The ball is harder to catch. Um, it's hold, harder to hold on to. Uh, you know, you have these rules. Like I had a rule all the time, which my guys hated, that if you were a ball handler or a ball carrier, you couldn't wear sleeves. You know, because I always thought that the sleeves made it slicker when you put three pressure points on the ball. The ball would slide out easier, and you'd be more susceptible to turnovers. All right, so it does have a huge impact. And the other thing is, is, you know, these young guys that play in the Southeastern Conference now, very few of them have ever played in cold weather. You know, at least in the NFL, like when I was at the Dolphins and we had to go play in Buffalo and New England and the New York Jets in December or January, the players at least got exposed to that to some point, and you had players on your team from all over the country, so some of them were used to it. Well, these guys in the Southeastern Conference are probably not going to be used to that, and it could have a huge impact on the game. Yeah, I think so too, especially with what happened. I mean, 
it's literally showcased in a lot of different situations. You talk about the Dolphins getting to play in AFC East matchups up in the cold weather climates. Then whenever they got to Kansas City and it was literally frozen, they looked like a completely different team. That is a that is an equalizer for a team that might not be as fast, mm-hmm. a team that might not be able to throw it as much, and for an environment that doesn't have hundred some thousand. Last weekend on Saturday, it was full chaos in the SEC, brother. I mean. Full chaos. chaos. After that Indiana Ohio State game, I thought uh, Indiana's out. I thought, man, there's going to be a. No- they gave the committee an excuse to leave them out. Like they gave them a reason to argue. And then everything unfolds in the SEC the way it does with a lot of teams that are kind of down there. And then Colorado loses. And then Army, who's obviously also in the conversation, loses. But the SEC full chaos this past weekend. What does that mean, you think? What, does that mean that every week that you win is a big win? in these major conferences or what do you think is the big message out of what happened on Saturday? Yeah. Well, I think what, you know, the playoffs have been a great thing for college football, but I also think the playoffs have made people more outcome oriented. Like if a coach stands up and talks about getting in the playoffs and you got to go to Oklahoma and play, and I'm just using Alabama as an example, and you got to beat Auburn in the iron bowl, your focus needs to be on what do I have to do to play well in the game that I'm playing in. Like, what's important now? What's important now is the game you're playing in now, the play that you're playing, the quarter that you're in. And uh, all these teams are good enough, especially in the SEC. It's such a deep conference, you know, that a 5-5 and team is a good enough team to beat, you know, probably anyone in the conference. So you can't ever let your hair down in any kind of way and not be psychologically ready to play. And I think... You know, when you watch the game, things that are indicators that guys don't have the right mental intensity to play is missed tackles, guys missing blocks up front, guys dropping balls. You know, those are kind of lack of concentration things that come from not having the right mindset. And that means you didn't approach it right in practice for that week. And then when you show up for the game and you think you're just going to show up and win, you know, it just doesn't happen that way. So, um you know, it should be a lesson for everybody, but I think we have more roller coasters, you know, in college football right now than we've ever had before. I think part of that is is the players are temporarily committed. That's totally different than be totally committed to your team and to your performance. You know, these guys can be thinking about, well, I'm not getting enough playing time. I'm not catching enough passes. Where am I going to go next year? I mean, all those things are distractions in terms of what your performance is and what your focus is on the task at hand and what your commitment to it is. Yeah, because you're not really playing for school. Not, and I'm not saying this is every, not everybody, not everywhere, because obviously there's some places that have people all in playing the right way. Oregon hasn't lost. Obviously, they've had no hiccups. There's other schools that are dominating and everything like that. But uh, we were talking about this, uh, I think, with Aaron yesterday about him – catching up with his Cal teammates from 2004, 20 years ago or whatever, and they start telling stories of what it was. And he was like, it was an immediate reminder that we were like playing for each other, you know, like, and that was what college always used to be. College always used to be that way. I think that's why a lot of us uh, older guys were old screaming at the clouds. Like when these kids started sitting out of bowl games, we understood the business decision, but it was like, this is one last time with the boys too. Like it, it was almost a, it's a completely different mindset. And I think it's all because what the world is right now. So I don't hold it against them, but how do you get people to stay committed to team? I don't, I, I don't know, you know, and the boys, I'm not hundred percent sure. Yeah, well, I, I don't think there's any question that I agree with you hundred percent that what we've created is a system that promotes self-indulgent behavior. Uh, in other words, how does this affect me? Uh, And, you know, we used to be on a team where the first thing you thought about is how does it affect the team? And if you made a mistake or whatever, um, it it, it killed you because you're letting your teammates down. Uh, I don't know if you can blame the players for this, but I think we can blame the system to some degree because it promotes this. I mean, everything about the system promotes this. You're not as committed to your team. You can leave whenever you want. You got guys getting in the portal in the middle of the season. Starters. And then, yeah, and then you you got guys worrying about where they're going to go based on how much money they're going to make or how much playing time they're going to get. So, you know, a lot of these things have a – and these guys are 18, 18, 19, 20 years old. All right, so it's more difficult to handle those things when you're that age. Uh, I don't think I could have handled it when I was in college. I mean, it was enough for me to handle what I needed to handle and behave well enough to 
to get by in those days. Um, so I, I just think it's really, really difficult for these guys to stay focused at the level they need to stay focused at. And, and you know, the, the real bottom line of it all is it, everything's based on performance. So what kind of value are you creating for yourself if you're not committed to doing being the best player that you can be? You're not creating value for yourself. You're not creating value for your future. It's going to affect where you get drafted. So, I mean, all these things are like, you know, anti-development, I call it, which is not a good thing for college players. Both football and human, you know, I mean, that is uh, – and I think about if I was at this age with this time, with oh. this access to money – there's no way I would remain focused on kicking footballs. No, no chance. With this thing right here, what? I, and I can make a, deer, a beard disappear in a half a second? Okay, cool. All I got to do is do this, put it up on the internet, then I can sell merch. It's like there's so many. For a lot of people, you know, sports was an avenue to uh, change the trajectory of your family tree. Okay, so I was one of those people. I think there's a lot of those people that are in there. Uh, Akush was one of those guys. Like, that was the main goal. That was the, hey, this is what we're working towards. This is how we do this. And I wasn't perfect by any means, but it was like trying to get to the money. But now you can get to the money, and you don't really. That's like, uh, if these kids are able to remain mentally tough and focused, it's almost like they're way better than we ever were, the kids that could do that. Right. But I could see how the distractions would get. It would have got me like that. I mean, there would have been – no, you too probably. 100%. Hundred, I mean, there is no chance. So good on these dudes that are able to stay focused, but I do think we're losing some shit. Yeah. You know, I, I think we're I think we're losing some shit. Any, any question about it. And, you know, one of the great things about sports, all sports, all being a part of a team, you know, that's, that's a hell of an experience, how to work with other people, how to buy into principles and values, how to trust and respect in those things, how to trust and respect your teammates, how to – have the kind of work ethic you needed to be to be successful, to reach your potential, to persevere through good and bad times, to learn from failings, to deal with success, to overcome adversity, to oh. pride and performance. I mean, you got all these things that were great Amen. virtue of athletics that we all learned. And I, 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 if I didn't play on teams when I was growing up and in college and have the opportunity to be involved in a team, I, I could have never had – the kind of successful career that I had, you know, as a coach or even in business or anything else, because those lessons are are not something that you can learn everywhere in our society, but you certainly can learn them by being a part of a team. Yeah, everything you just said there about sports is why we love it. You know, and that's why. That's why we, that's love, why it. we love it. I mean, and I don't know if you mentioned it there. I tried to listen to all the gospel you were preaching there that we love. And uh, the church of sport is a beautiful one. Working when you're tired, too. Like, that's a whole that's a whole another thing. Like, well, I'm tired. Well, the game don't care. Like, uh, the game's going to happen. You have to play in it. So you either right. figure the shit out or work through it, or you're going to not be – you're going to get embarrassed. Yeah. So it's like all those things, I think, are crucial to development of humans. And to your point, without it, I would nowhere, be nowhere near the human – I wouldn't be. I'd be, and, you know, I'd be flipping. You know, the driving sandwiches. force that we all had, too, Pat, was none of us wanted to be irrelevant. You know, nobody wants to be irrelevant. I mean, if you think back when you were kids and we would pick a baseball team, you know, and they put the bat, who gets picked, you know, everybody wanted to get picked. I Nobody wanted to be irrelevant. Uh, so now what is the value of being somebody that somebody wants to pick? I mean... Have we destroyed that? I mean, would you pick yourself if, if you're out there as a player that's leaving your team after four games or in the middle of the season or whatever? I mean, would you pick yourself? I think Nobody they, wants to be irrelevant. And nobody talks about the dudes that just uh, – they say they're hitting transfer portal, and then guess what? You live there now. Yeah. Uh, you know, everybody hears the story of, like, somebody hitting the transfer portal, getting signed somewhere, Cam Ward. Gets paid big. He's down in Miami. They completely change their entire franchise. You hear that story. What you don't hear about yeah. is the wide receiver that maybe didn't get enough balls one year somewhere and uh, hits transfer portal thinking that the grass is going to be greener. And guess what? Fucking desert, brother. There's no grass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, uh, yeah. it is a, it's a wild time in college ball, but somehow you got to remain focused. Coach, there's some teams out there like uh, Texas, Notre Dame, Penn State, Indiana, who a lot of people are saying, you know, they haven't played anything, anybody or, or beaten anyone good yet. If you were on the on the committee and, and say their strength of schedules are pretty even and their record's pretty even, what would you look at 
if you were determining the ranking, like when you're watching film or something like that, what, what would be most important to you? Well, you know, I hate to make comparisons, but I actually think they get it closer to right in basketball uh, because they have all these RPI things and, you know, strength of schedule, who you beat, how many good teams you beat, uh, not necessarily how many you played, but how many, how many you beat. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that should be uh, a real consideration. But I do think as we boil down to this, you know, like right now, um, hard to reward a team with three losses, um, especially the kind of losses that Ole Miss had and like Alabama's had uh, to, you know, pretty 500 teams, I'm going to call them. So pretty average, you know, teams where, you know, you got, you know, you, you, you got some other teams that maybe they didn't play the same competition but they didn't lose games to average teams either. So I think that matters. Huh. And um, the only team that could have an argument to get in with three losses, if Georgia actually plays in the SEC championship game, they really shouldn't be penalized if they, they would happen to lose the game. They would end up with three losses. But I don't think a team that didn't play in the championship game that has two losses should get in, especially if they played a good game, and it wasn't a blowout. So, um, yeah, we want to put we want to put the college well, but, we want the college football playoff committee. I think Reese does too. Every week, he asks him, like, "Hey, can you just say that if you play in the SEC championship, you're good, yeah. or if you play in the Big Ten championship, you're good? Can you say that that these are the two leading conferences this year?" And they said, "We'll just judge. You know, obviously, we hold championships in high regard. We will watch how they play in those games." So, I think what they're saying, Ward Manuel saying, without saying anything, is like if they look like a good team, we will reward them for being in the championship. But if they get steamrolled Oof. in this thing, it's like it will be held against them. It's kind of, We're trying to read through the lines there, but I think they will get rewarded if they end up playing in the championship. I, I think naturally humans in that place right. will reward that. I hope, at least. But, but the subjective part of this that you can never fix is the conferences are not equal. They're not equal in depth of good teams, nor are they equal in the quality of the best teams. So to give you an example, let's just take Ole Miss so I stay away from this whole Alabama thing. So if Ole Miss played in the Big 12, what would their record be? Um, They probably have one loss. That's that's the kind of subjective issues that we have in college football that's never going to change unless we take the best 40 teams in college football and put them in a league very similar to the 32 teams that are in the NFL. And then the competition level is probably going to be, um, you know, more, e- more equal so that now you could actually say beating good teams because you're playing good teams all the time. You know, I've always said that we should play all, nobody should play Mercer. Nobody should play a one double A school. Everybody should have to play these top 40 teams and then you'd have a better idea of okay who's who who are the best teams here but consistency and performance means something and that's why in Ole Miss and Alabama's case they didn't have consistency and performance they lost to teams they probably shouldn't have lost to so there should be a a penalty for that as well but then the counter argument not that SEC needs more counter arguments but like in the NFL right now a week after you play the Lions teams are like oh and oh and eleven or yeah. something like that, so it's like you in the deeper conferences. We'll say Big Ten and SEC right now. Uh, like big games every week means something too, as opposed to like a big game, JV game, big game, JV game, which some of these things are. And once again, I just got baptized in the college football world like four years ago, so I am just kind of watching it. But if it did, since it is going to a revenue share model, seemingly going to a salary cap model is seemingly what everything is kind of going towards. April 8th, we'll get the uh, final ruling on it. Do you think there's ever a chance for that top 40 league to ever happen? That would be a lot of people agreeing to a lot of shit, right? Sankey would have to talk to yeah. Petiti. Petiti would have to talk to all these other people. It would be the NCAA would have to get – that would be a lot of people that would have to agree on something, right, Coach? A lot of people would have to agree on something. But, you know, like I always say, it's not about the money. It's about how much. But if you had a league like that um, – they would be able to have a better TV contract, more revenue, 
Uh, and a lot of decisions are getting made in college athletics now, which is different than it used to be in the 80s, about what are the financial consequences of all this. So I do think there's a possibility, although I agree with you, it would make it would be a ton of changes. Yeah. It would be a lot of people having to agree to a lot of things yeah. and a lot of people having to succeed a lot of things and then obviously a lot of people getting used to brand new things. It would be crazy. And we just we can't lose what college ball is, though. Mm-hmm. You know. But, but one of the things that is going to happen, too, is even if we have revenue sharing, how many actual teams out there can afford to do $20 million to pay players and still be able to function you know, in the programs that they have. So they're either going to have to drop sports or not be able to compete because they can't afford to pay pay, pay the players. Jeez. I thought that money was just automatically popping out of thin air. That's what I thought was happening. <laughs> what the hell? I didn't know that. I thought that money was just showing up. That, I actually never even thought about how the money's getting. I'm just like, all of them. Everybody's, be getting, there. everybody's getting the same. It's like, no, you got to produce that now. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wild time to be alive. Coach, can't wait to see you down in uh, Texas. Happy Thanksgiving. What are we doing for the holiday? This will be the first time in a long time that we don't have 25 players over uh, for Thanksgiving, which I always enjoyed. Uh, It was a great experience to spend time with players in a non-football atmosphere. Uh, But it's also something we're looking forward to for the first time to just have family. Yeah. But just have your family there. So that's going to be great. But I wish you guys a great Thanksgiving. It's a great holiday. It's time for us to all have gratitude for all the things that we have and uh, not focus so much on what we don't have. So it's a good thing. We're grateful as hell for you. 